So welcome to this pre-recording scheduled for Friday, July 1st, lecture 14 of MCS 320, Introduction to Symbolic Computation. So in this lecture we look a little bit closer into normalizing expressions. Um, so this is already lecture 15. And we are closing off a second chapter. So this lecture is more heavy on concepts, not so much on technical difficulties. Uh, so we have already uh, considered algebraic numbers. So this was our first uh, important uh, technical difficulty. And we also looked in great detail into expression trees. Uh, so that was kind of the tech the second technicality. Uh, so today we will see that uh, as expressions um, we may see something entirely different and yet mathematically the expressions are equivalent. Uh, so how to decide this? Well the answer is with normalization. Uh, we will see this for polynomials in one variable for which there is a canonical form and we will also look at uh, polynomials in several variables. This is a course on symbolic computation uh, so the normalization is an important uh, problem in symbolic computation but we end with a numerical uh, test on equality. If the symbolics fail, we may resort to a probability one numerical test. Okay, let's dive in. Uh, so what is our problem? Let us uh, look at this problem with an example. So here we see two expressions, um, P and Q. If you look at these expressions, the answer is obviously no. Uh, as two expressions, they are different, very clearly. But notice, if you start expanding P, then you find Q. So, mathematically, they are actually the same. Um, so, one way to look at this is to look at the difference. But the difference is another expression. And you see, if you look at this expression, it's obviously not zero. But then again, if you look closer, if you start expanding the first part, you see that there is an x here and there's a minus x there. So these two cancel out. There is an x times y and here there's a minus x times y. So this expression reduces to zero. Um, so uh, you can see this as a test on equality, but you can also reduce it to a computation. Um, if the two expressions are the same, mathematically then, then there is a way to reduce their difference to zero. And in a way, formulating it as this, uh, is equivalent so you have a very complicated expression so here actually the difference at first looks twice as long as p and q because it's actually you we, we just have uh, subtracted them and not simplified and the question the resolution of the question is a simplification so we have one big expression and we simplify it Okay, so now some terminology. Uh, what is a normal form of an expression? A normal form gives a unique representation of the expression. Once you pick on a normal form, then every expression that is the same will result in the same representation in this normal form. So the process of bringing a process, uh, bringing an expression into normal form, so that process of 
bringing an expression into normal form is called normalizing expression. So also the title of this lecture is by now explained. We will look at different ways to normalize expressions. And we, we, we have already seen several normal forms. If you look at the polynomial in one variable, then the Horner form is a normal form. Quite an interesting one if you're interested in evaluation. Um, another normal form of a polynomial in one variable is obtained by fully expanding the polynomial, removing those terms that end up with a zero coefficient. So if you see a plus x and a minus x, you, it becomes uh, the, the, the same. So removing terms with a zero coefficient means that you have collected terms of the same degree. Uh, and you sort uh, the monomials from high to low degree. So in some sense, um, I have perhaps not been that precise in steps two and three. One, when, when you are collecting terms of the same degree, you can actually do this while you are sorting. So for the polynomials in one variable, we have a unique normal form in this way. So this is often said the, the canonical form. Uh, so if for all the polynomials uh, there is one form that is clearly the normal form, uh, it's called a the canonical form. For rational expressions, we can expand or factor numerator, expand or factor the denominator. So we have four different normal forms there already. And we also have the partial fractions. That's another normal form. So for rational expressions, it's a lot harder to talk about the canonical form. For polynomials in one variable, the fully expanded, the sorted, and the removal of the zero coefficients is actually a much better candidate, is actually the canonical form, the most commonly used normalization. How you would, by default, write a polynomial in standard notation. Okay, in uh, looking at multivariate polynomials, so I will in short while demonstrate in a Sage Mat Jupyter notebook uh, how to apply the rewriting as multivariate polynomials to solve the problem with the two expressions that we started with. Um, with uh, multivariate polynomials, polynomials in several variables, we have many, many uh, ways how we can write a polynomial. So uh, that is then in uh, deciding, uh, deciding on when two polynomials in several variables, so here in this example in three variables, when are these three, uh, when are these two polynomials identical or not? So, um, you see here that we first have to decide on an order of the variables. So we first write x before y and y before z and all the constants come last. Um, so that's the natural order. Um, so we also sort in that sense uh, monomials from high degree to low degree and we break the tie when we have monomials of the same degree. So I'm explaining now the degree lexicographical order which might be the most common generalization uh, if you go from polynomials in one variable to more variables. A simpler order is actually the pure lexicographical order where you do not really consider the degrees. Uh, so here you see uh, one example 
uh, where we have the x to the power 3, the 3 is larger than the 2. Here we have 2 and 2 as the degrees in x, and then we look at the second variable that occurs. So all the monomials are ordered, uh, x, y, z. Uh, in some sense, we only store the exponents. So this is stored as 3, 3 0, 0. This is 2, 1, 0. And here this is 2, 0, 0. Because the y comes before the constant term, we're going to write x square y before uh, x square. So it's not that we consider degrees, we still consider the lexicographical order here. So all the monomials that have an x in them appear first. And then here we have one lone e z to the power 3. So you see that in the degree lexicographical order, the monomial z to the power 3 appears much sooner because it is a third degree um, monomial. But still, among all our all the monomials of degree 3, it occurs last uh, because we have this uh, variable order. So, fixing one order in multivariate polynomials and casting your expression as into the polynomial ring with respect to that order also solve the, solves the normalization question uh, for expressions that are polynomials and several variables. Symbolically problem that's solved. Uh, now, so here, this is a repeat of this. Uh, now, the problem is the exponential growth or the possible exponential growth as you deal with polynomials with more and more variables. Um, so, that means that if you have a big polynomial in memory, you don't you don't want to construct an object of the same size, uh, or or if you have two polynomials, two big polynomials f and g, you don't want to uh, copy uh, make two copies where you have to order them differently. So uh, also the whole process of doing this normalization with a growing number of terms may take quite a while already. Here is a numerical test, and this is particularly very useful if you have, say, a fast callable object to representation for these uh, polynomials. So you can effic efficiently and fast evaluate the polynomials. What do you do then? You compute, uh, you generate a random point. So here with x, y, z, we have three coordinates, a, b, c and we evaluate the two polynomials and compare their function values. So this is a numerical evaluation. This is a numerical test, uh, which we will demonstrate uh, next. Okay, together with the expressions, well, uh, the decision whether two expressions are identical or whether one complicated expression simplifies to zero is an important problem in symbolic computation. So let me look at now some examples. So I will swap the slides for the Jupyter notebook. Uh, so here you see the beginning of the prepared notebook. Um, I can now very briefly scroll through this preparation, but I believe it's um, perhaps more better that I start making a new Jupyter Notebook and step for step uh, on an example illustrate what it is that we are doing in this lecture. So, uh, lecture 15 already on of MCS 320. Uh, covers normalization.
So that's the very short uh, title of this lecture. So this is the notebook that I'm using during my recording. So the first topic is on uh, when are two expressions the same. So that's essentially the question. Um, so the motivating, our motivating example consists of of two expressions in x and y. So I will explicitly declare that I have uh, these uh, variables. So by declaring x and y as variables like this, everything that will be in x and y will belong to the symbolic ring. So I will define E1 which is x times um, so now I'm a little bit lost now. So I have x times x plus y so that's E1 E2 is the expanded version And I can formulate the question. Now, is E1 the same as E2? So let's print that out. So both are uh, symbolic expressions, and obviously they are not the same. Um, so as expressions, uh, what I can do is I can print out the operator of both. So the one operator is the multiplication, so of E1. Uh, the other one is the addition. And um, I can also ask for the operands. So the operands are also different. Uh, so very obviously as expressions E1 is not the same as E2, but mathematically E1 is equivalent to E2. So if we are computing with E1 and E2, then it's kind of often not very good, it's kind of um, awkward to say the least that we are using for the same thing different uh, notations. So that's how you can look at uh, this as well. Okay, let's ask Sage. Uh, so let's compute the difference. Uh, so I will define D as E1 minus E2 and uh, this is not really a help uh, we actually get a longer expression um, so the answer so the difference so when we ask to compute the difference we get a longer expression So now it's probably also to us actually clear that if you look at, if you would expand this, you would have x square and a minus x square here, and here you have an x 
times y, but that is equivalent to the minus x times y that is there. So I can ask to expand. So that is not done automatically because of the expression as well. That may result. So because of the risk of expression as well, there was no automatic expansion of D. But if we force the expand, we see that the difference reduces to zero. Therefore, what we have we computed? We have computed that E1 is the same as E2. So we had a bigger expression, the difference, that resulted into a difference equal that was then reduced, simplified to zero. Okay, so that's one just one example. So what we have actually computed is a normal form. Uh, so the expansion is a normal form. So let me now explain in the second section how this can be solved as a rewriting process when we rewrite multivariate polynomials. So we can cast the expressions. Uh, so just to make the point here, E1 is a general expression. Also, E2 is a general expression. So to solve the problem we have solved already uh, in another way. So there are many ways to solve the same problem. So we show many ways in the hope that when it comes for you to solve actually a problem that you will remember one of the ways. So to solve the problem in another way we will cast, and here I will emphasize this a little bit, so the cast uh, has kind of uh, an active connotation to it as well. We will cast the expression E one into the collection or the set of all polynomials in X and Y with integer coefficients. As mathematicians, we write this as ZX comma Y. So this uh, set so this collection uh, is denoted by ZZ, capital ZZ, X comma Y. So I will make polynomials. I will make a polynomial P1. That is the transformation of E1. So it's the cost of E1 into ZZXY. Or perhaps I can also print. No, I probably should print this. Okay, that's one sentence. Um, so you see that during this cost, the expansion happened. So uh, when we work with this ring of polynomials, we call the library lip singular. So singular is a compute, compu computer algebra system for 
computational algebraic geometry, very good with polynomials and several variables. So we do the same with P2, or I'm going to do the same with E2. So I'm going to cast uh, the polynomial, and let me copy and paste the entire statement. So P2 has type and is the cost of the expression. Okay, so are the two now identical? Um, so why does this solve our problem? Well, look P1 looks identical to P2 and if we want to verify this once more we can also compute the difference um, so to re 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 to actually to reduce this to a computation we see that the difference of P1 and P2 reduces to zero. So the normalization problem, uh, you can see this as a data representation problem. When we rewrite our expressions into a polynomial ring, we're doing some rewriting. We can also see this as a computational problem. We see if we can compute zero uh, out of the difference. Okay, so these are these two examples. Uh, so let me um, illustrate the monomial orders. Uh, so there are many, many normal forms. for polynomials in several variables. So first we decide on the order of the variables by default dictionary, and then we decide on the order of the monomials, uh, either pure lexicographic or taken into account the decrease. So let us look at some examples with integer coefficients. So I will generate so let me make a polynomial ring. Let us generate an example in a polynomial ring. So an example of a polynomial in x, y, and z in the three variables with integer coefficients. And uh, where the monomials are ordered lexicographically. So for the variables, we assume the default alphabetical order. So if that is not specified, then we assume that um, we have this order here. So this is heavy on concepts. Uh, on exams, uh, it will be expected that sentences, um, like consider an expression as a polynomial with integer coefficients with in the variables x, y, z in the default alphabetical order with monomials ordered lexicographically. So casting the expression into or, or generating an expression here in this sense, uh, it's supposed that you will be able to do this. 
So I will define my set of all polynomials. I call it capital P Lex. So I have to define x, y, and z in this order here. It's a polynomial ring, and I have to use this now word polynomial ring because I want to deviate from the uh, default order. So the fact that I have now my p -lex, so I'm gaining something. So I have called at the left of my assignment, p -lex is the name of my set. And I can then also uh, quickly ask for a random element. So let me generate a degree 8 polynomial with 20 terms. So here we see the polynomial. So the polynomial is in three variables. So we see x, y, and z coming up. It's a 20-term polynomial. Uh, look at uh, the ending. So the degree of the monomial at the end of is 4. Uh, now the monomial just in front of it is only degree 2, but it has a y sitting in there. So in ordering these monomials, first all monomials in x appear. So if there is an x coming in, then all those monomials come before. And you see first all monomials with degree 5, then all those 4, 3, 3, and 2, and you see it uh, descending like this. So it's just like you would order the words in the alphabet, uh, the, the words in a dictionary. So it's also called a dictionary order. So we have one polynomial, so this polynomial could be given to you. Um, so what would the question then be? Reorder the terms in P according to the degree lexicographic order where the order of the variables is reversed. So we actually now have that z has to come before y, before x, and before all the constants. So we're going to see that uh, z to the power 4 moved up uh, a lot. A lot. So how do we do this? Well, I'm going to declare another ring. So now be careful for the order of the variables. So z, y, x. So and in, in a way, I can get get by with the with the other notation. So the shorter notation. Uh, so I don't need to type in polynomial ring anymore. So the degree order is the default order. Uh, I can also explicitly state it as dec lex. So the order is dec lex. So if I want to do that, it's even more cumbersome. But here the shorter, so the default order is degree lexical. The order of the variables is important. And let me show the cost of the polynomial P in this new ring. So we see that the z to the power 4 has shifted up considerably, so has gained places. And you see that uh, the polynomial is, is of degree 8, but in the lexicographical order, uh, there was no 8 that is, was at the beginning, because of this pure lexicographical order. You see that there were monomials, so here this monomial is actually the monomial, and that's also here a monomial of degree 8. So these two monomials now, because it is degree, uh, they come up quite early. So the two monomials of degree 8 come before everything else. So the next monomial is of degree 7. And then 
So then it is ordered uh, along the lexicographical order. Um, where I must confess that I'm... Uh, no, so this is 5, 6, 7. And this is also 7. So I'm still a little bit confused why it uh, does not put the z to the power 3 in front before uh, this monomial here. Okay, um, so let me, I'm now actually really curious if there is a difference if I use the explicit construction polynomial ring ZZ and now I declare that the order has to be degree lex. Okay, so now you see that there is the difference. Uh, so the default order is actually not degree lexicographical. It is degree, but the tie-breaking uh, is actually not specified. So if you really specify degree lexicographic, then you see here that the z to the power 4 in this monomial degree 7 it comes before the other one because the powers in z is higher here okay uh, last item um, is the numerical test um, so let me make the header so the polynomials and several variables they can get quite long um, so I still have my E1 so let me go back to the original question is E1 the same as E2. So that's my question. So we solved it already. So this is actually now the third way how to solve this problem. Um, so we solved it via expansion, so the normalization. We solved this with as a multivariate polynomial. And there, there are still many, many ways to do this because you have all these monomial orders. Uh, now we're going to solve this numerically, uh, knowing that the expressions are callable objects. So we can evaluate the expressions numerically. As we have done before already. So we're going to exploit this. Uh, so in the numerical test, we generate we generate a random point. So here we have an x and y, we need two values. So a numerical means in our context complex. So I will generate a random complex number a and a random complex number b so i have a point with coordinates a and b you can also type them up but it will be too cumbersome and uh, perhaps not at all that random as here so uh, I have two values then. I will evaluate E1. So let me do this explicitly 
with the keyword argument. So I have V1, which is the value, the numerical value, complex number. Now that by itself doesn't really say much, but watch if I do this for the second expression. You see that we have two identical numbers. So this already is the indication that with respect to this precision, the expressions are the same. So we can also compute the difference. And the difference uh, is less than machine precision. So within so what is the conclusion now? Within the working precision of the 53 bits, the value, the values agree. So the expressions match. Now, if you are a, a little bit uh, suspicious, you can say, look, uh, this test is very easy to trick. I just add to one of these expressions a number much less than 10 to the power minus 16. So 2 to the power minus 100. Then mathematically, the expressions are different. But the numerical test will still give me 10 to the power minus 16. So to gain more confidence, uh, you should take more samples and in a higher working precision. Okay, uh, so that are that is the end of this pre-recording. So we have covered three techniques for the normalization problem. The reduction to the normal form uh, via the expansion, the collection, and the simplification. So that was suffice, sufficient. So we compute zero, essentially. We reduce a complicated expression, although not that complicated here, but we can reduce this to zero. Uh, more in general, if our expressions take the shape of, can take the shape of multivariate polynomials, then we can cast into the proper polynomial ring. Note that here there are many, many normal forms as well, depending on the order of the variables, depending on the term orders, the monomial orders that we are using. So, and finally, our, as our expressions are callable objects, we can resort to numerical evaluations, which is typically faster, but with then also has some limits. Uh, one has to be considerate of the working precision. So I hope that this lecture was interesting and I sign off here. So this is the end of our second chapter.